Howdy and welcome. You are listening to A Mom's Guide to Wine, a guided wine tasting with candid reflections on motherhood. Here we spill the tea, but never the wine. And we are your hosts, Eliza James and Rosie Gold. And we are so glad you joined us for today's tasting adventure. Full disclosure, for those with little ears around, 90% of our topics and language will be more on the R rating scale. Also, we are not professionals or experts. We are simply sharing our experiences and including some Google searches for support. We are amateur wine enthusiasts and professional moms. That is our skill set. But first, the wine. Of course. And today's wine is from Forever Vineyards. It is a Pinot Noir. Ooh, that sounded pretty. I know, it did. (laughs) That was nice. I bet you can't do that twice. (laughs) Yep, Forever Vineyards, Pinot Noir 2020. California wine. So, this is a really pretty bottle. It's a, I don't know, what would you call it? It's like a fluted bottle, right? Like They definitely took in like the forever word and the marketing silver and it's beautiful. Yeah, it's very pretty. The, um... Reminds me of like the infinity symbol. Lots of filigree and... Yeah, the, the, and the foil on top has their, has FV, so forever vineyards. And then, um, if you read the bottle... It says, forever wine is perfect for new memories. It is the wine you will keep coming back for and remember with fondness. This Pinot Noir has floral aromas mixed with cherries and spice, followed by well-balanced flavors of strawberry and a hint of cocoa. That's <laughs> interesting. And we haven't had a cocoa wine. So like chocolate-covered wine. strawberries. I mean, I'm down for that. It says to enjoy with chicken, fish, and pork. And it is... a uh, a 13.5% volume, so I hope we have hydrated before we open this bad boy. <laughs> so, uh, I brought my electric opener for today. Here. I'll take the foil off, but then you can you can remove it. Oh, it came off so pretty. Oh, I said that. Now look at this. There it goes. Here you go. So. Uh, I've never been the person <clears throat> to do this. I'm going to let you do it. You can do this. Yeah, push the down button. I'm a little crooked. Hold on. I can't do this. <laughs> Yay! There it is. Look Ta-da! at that! That was so fun. Okay. Yeah, see, it's not bad. Here, we'll dispense the cork. Very dark. I can't get the cork out. There it goes. It's a very dark. Ooh, it's very ar- aromatic. Yes. Like you can like smell it as you're pouring it. It smells nice. It smells really sweet. But it doesn't taste so, as sweet as it smells. I I don't know if I've had a Pinot Noir. We had that oh, Pinot Noir Rosé. Really that was about as close as we've we've never had a. This is a red. I smell flowers. <laughs> it does smell very floral. <laughs> I can't just, I get the cherries though. Yeah. I don't know. Let's see. We're going to taste it. Okay. A little bit of bitter, but. Mm-hmm. I wonder if that's that cocoa at the end yeah. of it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it. I'm going to do my two more sips. Hold on. Give me a second. I'm getting some of the strawberry. You get yeah, a little bit, almost like a citrus there when I did it the second time. Hmm. I'm also just recovering from a cold, so I'm not no. sure if my uh, sweet taste buds are activated. Well, you know, it smells very sweet. It smells. I, you know, it's it is dry, er, but mm-hmm. I don't think I. It's not it's attacking not a, it's, my senses. It's not a dessert wine, but it's also not something like I would eat with my steak. You know <laughs> what I mean? Somewhere in between. Like, it's somewhere in between that. Like, it's it's pretty good. Like a meal, but a light meal. A light meal. Yeah, this is very nice. Uh, the Forever Vineyards is part of the family-framed winery that's been growing grapes since 1924. So they've been around a little bit. They're in Manteca, Y'all can correct me if I pronounce that wrong. California. 
They are part of a sustainable farming practices that are central to the family's firmly held belief that they are responsible for tending to the earth using environmentally sensitive farming techniques. So like that, um, that other wine we talked about with the bees. What was that one? Oh, yeah. Honig. Yes. That one. They, it sounds like they do a lot of the same practices from mm-hmm. what little I could find out about them. Very similar. So all natural pest control, which is good because we don't want to eat chemicals. So No. Um, oh, it makes sense now. Chicken, fish, <clears throat> and pork dishes. Yeah, like I think it would bounce that makes very sense. nice. Yeah, it definitely would. It says it's got black cherry aromas mixed with coffee and spice. This is from the website, not off the bottle. But um, so they their their advertising's a little different from the bottle to the website. Mm-hmm. But it says on here a hint of vanilla, and I kind of catch the vanilla yeah, in now here. That they say it. Yeah, like I I get that. So this is tasty. We highly recommend that. I like it. So we went with this wine to go with today's episode. Because uh, today in season two, episode seven, because we're still bringing it back, but today we're bringing back mental health, as in your mental health, as in your partner's mental health, as in like your little family unit. Yes. As healthy as we can be. Yes. And so we got this nice, floral, decadent wine to sip on while we discuss this, because I like it. I'm going to sip on it. <laughs> so... I want to start off by saying that if you or someone that you know is struggling with depression or thoughts of suicide, that we ask you to please seek help. That can be at your doctor's office. It can be at your county's mental health authority. uh, Something along those lines. Yes. You're not alone. Don't struggle alone, okay? Um, There's that. So, as a mom and a woman and a person, your mental health matters. I want to I wanna put that out there. Like, we cannot take care of our families. If we're not if, taking care of ourselves. If we are not taking care of ourselves. Um, you have to kind of put yourself at the forefront for that reason. And it's so easy to allow yourself to be the background noise. Yeah, very much so. And just, like, stop showering, stop brushing your teeth, mm-hmm. stop doing personal mm-hmm. care. Because somebody else needs you. Because I've got to do X, Y, and Z before I go to bed. Mm -hmm. So why should I do those extra little hygiene things? And it's those little things that make you feel normal and human and are very vital to your well-being. It's those little things. So, like, I know they say that when people suffer from depression, they're like, if you can just, like, move from one location to the other, like, that's a big deal. Oh, I have a cat trapped in my office. That's funny. <laughs> I was like, what are you looking at? There's a cat. And she's yeah. going to be very angry here in a minute when she realizes I like, she I can't like get cats. out the door. <laughs> That's okay. If you'll hear a meow, it's okay. Oops. Um, but like moving from one location to another, uh, something as simple as brushing your teeth, like that can take a lot of effort. And so we do recommend that you do those small things. Move from one location to the other. It doesn't mean like from one side of the couch to the other. They mean like move from your bedroom to your living room. Right. Or from your living room to your kitchen. Like change locations. Um, because sometimes doing that can start getting your brain up and moving and doing the feel goody things that it's supposed to do. But recognizing it in yourself is just as hard as sometimes recognizing it in your partner. So how would we recognize anxiety and depression in each other? It's um, not easy um, because most people are really good at hiding it, right? Like, we can go a long time before we figure it out. But there are um, questions that you can ask, and there are questions you should not ask. And uh, <laughs> yeah. who knew? Because some might make things a little more difficult, awkward, assertive. Yeah, they're just not good questions. So um, medicalnewstoday.com had a great article on the, on these types of questions because I was looking into that. Like, what should we say? What should we not say to somebody who may or may not be suffering from anxiety, depression, or, or other thoughts, right? Like, it's all mental health. So questions you should ask are, can you help me understand how you are feeling? What activities do you find enjoyable right now? I think that's a big one. Like, yes. Like, I don't know. I told my daughter the other day, like, she was feeling bad. And I was like, well, you should online shop. I said, don't actually buy anything. 
because you're 12 and you don't have access to a credit card. But I said, you should online shop. I said, actively put things in a cart. I said, because that releases endorphins in your brain, which releases <laughs> the happy signals in your brain. And so online shopping is, that's why people do it all with, the time. With limitations that they don't like mm. develop into a, uh, it's a fine shopping, shopping spree. <laughs> it's a fine coping mechanism for right now, but I do it. But I never actually buy the stuff. I like to put it in a cart. And then when I'm feeling better Think later, about I, whether or not I actually want it, I delete it. I'm one of those. I like, but it makes me feel good to put the things in the cart and then I delete it. And if the individual responds with, I don't know of any activities, then you need to maybe help them find a new activity that will bring them joy. Maybe sitting outside. Yeah. Sometimes that's enough. I make my daughter go sit outside some days. Um, do you enjoy spending time with others? Um, people who are in severe depressive modes or even those with high anxiety uh, levels with people or to be around people don't enjoy being around people and so I think those are good questions because then you can know so we're not going to go shopping at the mall because <laughs> that might not be best um, you might not even want to be around me and how are your energy levels I feel like that's a really good one because when you're down and out your energy levels are also yes. down and out um, are you sleeping more or less than usual? Are you eating more or less than usual? I think those can be things that you maybe notice, but maybe put off as, eh, they're just a little off. Right. I mean, I pick up on those cues in my family and they get annoyed with me and I ask those questions all the time. Um, are you able to concentrate on things right now? And do you have thoughts of death or suicide? The last one's really important because um, it might mean other interventions as well. And even if you wanted to ask one step up of, have you ever thought of hurting yourself? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because those are tough questions, but I think they're real questions that yes. deserve real answers. And most people are pretty honest, uh, especially if that's where they're at. So questions to avoid. I'm going to go through these real quick. Why don't you just cheer up? Don't I make you happy? When will you feel better? Can't you understand that this is all in your head? Why are you making such a big deal about this? Are you aware that others have it much worse than you? Mm. So uh, let's think about what we just said. <laughs> and like, why are these questions crap? Because they can make you feel worse than you already do. Exactly. So we don't want to ask those questions. Sometimes sitting in silence is the best thing we can do for somebody who is suffering. That is it. Just being present. Mm -hmm. You don't have to say anything. Just letting them know, well, I'm right here for you. And, and sitting in that awkward silence is enough. So, um, it's not easy to do these things. Um, especially when it's like you're talking about your significant other. Um, but it's important that you find humor in your role in your relationship. So I definitely use that one all the time. Yeah. And sometimes it's a coping mechanism. Yes. I have a coping mechanism about it. It's a problem. Uh, but it's not, it's not always an unhealthy coping mechanism. I know that's one that I discuss with my kids. Is, is this a healthy coping mechanism or is this an unhealthy right. one? Um, Indulging in foods because you're sad would be an unhealthy coping mechanism. Right. But um, it's the same thing as overindulging because you're happy. So, but uh, humor. Humor can be both, I think, at And times. I can show you when it's not helpful. <laughs> so anytime I'm stressed of any kind, I smile a lot and I crack jokes. And so I don't like needles. And so whenever I go to the doctor and I have, like, a joint injection or something, I bust out laughing the whole time. Oh, yeah. And it's, like, hysterical laughing, like, like for no reason. Yeah. And it's very loud and awkward, and then it makes the the nurses laugh because of how awkward it is. Mm -hmm. But really, I'm panicking on the inside, mm -hmm. right? Um, some other moments where, like, my husband has gotten mad at me are there's a... Uh, moment where we are having a disagreement and towards the end because I'm getting nervous I'm starting to smile I'm starting to laugh and he says I need you to take me seriously right now and it's really just me 